Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with Democratic gubernatorial candidate Lawrence Rael as part of the Mercury's project to interview all candidates before the New Mexico primary June 3rd. Lawrence Rael's experience is deeply rooted in administration and government operations. He resigned recently as, as the executive uh, director of uh, the Federal Farm Service Agency in New Mexico. He served for eight years as the executive director of the Middle uh, Region Council of Governments here and worked for 12 years as uh, chief administrative officer of the city of Albuquerque. He has also played a major role in uh, the creation of the New Mexico Rail Runner, which we all use gratefully. And uh, he is also uh, the past uh, president of the Green Chamber of Commerce in New Mexico. It's really great to have you here with us today, and uh, I think we'll get into some very interesting topics. Thank you very much, VB. I, it's nice to see you. I appreciate you taking some time to give us an opportunity to talk a little bit about the campaign. But, uh, you know, I've been a big fan of yours for many, many years, read your columns, and uh, many folks in Albuquerque and in New Mexico that have read your work uh, always uh, talk about it in very high regard. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> In a recent uh, release of yours, uh, you talked about the uh, dark dealings and uh, questionable judgment of the McCluskey-Martinez administration, which I thought was an interesting little, little verbal play there. And I would love you to expand on this a little bit for our audience, if you would. My conversation or my, my perspective on this issue is, is very straightforward. When you, there are two phases to, to governance, if, I, if you might appreciate. One is running for office and hiring your political staff to help you get the office. But once you're in office, it's about governing and it's about making sure that the government and what the government does is appropriate and helps the citizens. What I find very interesting in this particular uh, administration is that the political staff has never been sent home. They are very, very much a part of the governing of the of this administration. So someone like a McCluskey, who is a political operative and is very well versed in political campaigns, etc., is really appears to be really calling the shots. And this National Review article that came out just recently really points to that issue that when you have the political operatives, if you will, being the gatekeepers of the administration and being the ones that are determining the policies, etc. It leaves all of us with a very, very, uh, a lot of questions about whether or not uh, this governor is really governing uh, based on what we need to have done in New Mexico, or if it's still really a part of the extended campaign that runs into the administration. And and there are many, many examples of, of where the administration has not been, in my opinion, very transparent about what it's doing, even though it was part of the uh, part of their original, if you will, campaign rhetoric during the campaign that it was about reform and about transparency and about accountability. And then you still have the political arm of the, of the campaign still managing the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, that concerns me a great deal. Uh, we didn't vote for Jay McCluskey. Right. We voted for Susana Martinez, right. or those that did. And, and there ought to be a, a very clear separation between the two. And that doesn't seem to be happening in this administration. And, and you can see it play itself out on, for example, the Racino dealings with the, with the downs here in Albuquerque or the issue with the behavioral health care issues. Um, a lot of those issues seem to have some connection to the political side of, of running for office versus making sound decisions about what's right for New Mexico and being transparent and straight up about that. So I suppose you could say as well that uh, running state government using private emails is not necessarily the most transparent way to operate. Could you uh, chat about that a little bit with us? One of the things I've learned, the lessons I've learned in my 35 years of public administration working at various levels, whether it was in Washington, D.C., although back in the day, emails weren't exactly the kind of <laughs> way of communication <laughs> until uh, here of recent, uh, which maybe dates both of us. But as when I was in City Hall or when I ran the Council of Governments, uh, this, this whole email discussion has to be, everybody has to know that whatever you do in the public domain, especially as, a, as an official, whether it's an appointed or an elected official, is subject to review by the public. Uh, and what happens many times, or what appears to have happened in this case, is you have a, uh, 
a level of influence in the decision making again that's rooted in in secrecy in having private emails because the idea here is that they're not publicly they're not open to the public because they're quote uh, private emails and therefore uh, they're not going to be called as as open as open records requests because they're not in the uh, done on public equipment or public t or or during the government time and so as a result it really is a backdoor way of of managing the government and making decisions that you and I as as citizens would not normally not know about because uh, they're not be using public if you will public uh, equipment such as a computer or uh, or maybe even doing them during you know while they're being paid as public employees but they are influencing the decisions that are being made yeah. And that is really where in, therein lies against this transparency issue that we spoke about earlier. And that is that we're having what appears to be decisions on very important matters of the state being done in a very uh, unofficial manner, supposedly, but still having a lot of influence on what happens on the day-to-day -day operations of government. And that, again, leaves the public with the taste that where there is smoke, there may be fire. And are there more of these kinds of communications of these kinds of decisions being made or at least being influenced not in the public eye but behind the scenes that ultimately make their way into the decisions that are made on behalf of the public and that's again another one of those transparency issues that is uh, very concerning to me and, and and quite frankly vb really again leads to this whole discussion that we've had over the years about the transparency in government do we want to see government operate there's no questions that that people have conversations all the time and we, we're not going to we're not interested in those conversations but we are interested in knowing that if there are decisions that are being influenced that are or conversations that are influencing public policy by public officials behind the scenes in such a fashion that th that information be made available to the public so that we know who's running the government so from everything that we've seen over the last months about the behavioral health crisis and scandal in new mexico now we see we see operations, we see the effects mm -hmm. of what appear to be behind the scenes deals and operations and things that, have, that were planned long before uh, the audit was made. Mm -hmm. uh, we see what appears to be, again, uh, some, very, some very calculated, some very tricky and expert manipulations of public opinion and of public processes and of the, uh, the procurement law, for instance, and other things. Um, that seems to me a good example of what you're talking about. How would, how would have, how would have one ideally dealt with the behavioral health issue? I mean, was it an issue in the first place before, uh, um, before the, the administration made it uh, one? Well, I will tell you that we don't know even today after all this discussion how much of an issue it was beforehand. But giving everyone the benefit of the doubt that there was an issue. The classic approach to this to me is, and again, this goes back to having a, an appreciated understanding that there are rules and structures in place, even at the state level to deal with procurement issues and deal with changing contracts. But the first thing that I would have approached this discussion would have been to bring in the, the people that are in the organization, i.e. in this case, the department, and have a conversation about what are we trying to fix here? What, what is the real issue? And is it an issue that is that is um, a, an issue that is a, that appears to be uh, across the board, or is it an issue that's very focused on one or two or three providers? And get an assessment of what that issue. Now, again, if this issue is broad enough, then let's have a conversation about what we do to fix it, and let's move forward with realizing that we do have a responsibility to the to the people that are being served under these contracts to ensure that there's a continuity of service. Secondly, that there are all other providers that may be available to do this work in New Mexico that may be able to step in and do some of that work. And more importantly, let's make sure that if we have this audit that appears to have been done, that there are some real issues that we began to provide that information to the public so that the public isn't left wondering whether or not this was a, a deal that was contrived, or whether or not there was a political payback of some sort, or, or whatever the, 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 what, whatever you want to say about how it was put together. But the point is that 
again, it goes back to this discussion of let's make sure the public knows what we're trying to fix here and what the issues were. My, my big concern that even today, even today, there's not enough uh, understanding. Um, and I would say even to the extent that our attorney general has not given us a complete full report on this, that there must be some issues there. But uh, no one really knows what, what these issues really are about. And quite frankly, Vivi, we've left a lot of folks out in New Mexico without services. True. And secondly, we've outsourced the, jo outsourced the jobs. It's a company out of Arizona who we all know apparently now has, has been disclosed, had a relationship with the governor and her staff beforehand. And it leaves everybody again with this whole uh, bad taste in their mouth that that it really isn't about reforming government. It's really, again, about political expediency. Is this really a contractor that may have provided some some support for the governor? Is this really a deal that was put together beforehand? And, and you can't help but jump to those conclusions when you start trying to connect the dots and trying to follow the money and follow the issue. And that's what troubles me, again, about the way this was handled. There's not a real open discussion about it. And uh, and I would and I just worry about if this is the way this was handled. There are a lot of other contracts and a lot of other decisions that are being made by this administration that have ramifications for the state on a long term basis that maybe we don't know about. And and that's again, I again, I'm a very practical person. I typically like to give people the benefit of the doubt. But this pattern of behavior and this pattern of of really of lack of transparency on these issues give me great concern about where New Mexico is headed and what other decisions have been made that we may not know of today. So when the governor says uh, in a press conference that uh, the children, youth and family department's handling of, uh, of, uh, of the Omari Varela's tragic, tragic death uh, is, um, is really sort of beyond investigation, that nothing really wrong is with, uh, uh, is going on at the department that that this was uh, this was indeed a tragedy but but that there's nothing really to be done about it is that another sort of sort of veil of of denial and and um, obfuscation and, and just um, uh, trying to push terrible problems real issues under the rug even further I will tell you, Vivi, I, I, I am as concerned as anyone when you have a tragedy of this, ma of this nature. Omari Varela was uh, a young boy who, was, who, unfortunately, the system failed, the, and it failed terribly. And, and the idea that um, we, that this administration perceives that nothing's wrong uh, is really, in my opinion, an insult to, to the family and to, and to all of us as who rely or those of us who rely on CYFD to do its work, on, on the system to do its work. It's a complicated system. There is no question mm -hmm. that there were lots of agencies that had a piece of this, of this situation, whether it was the police department here in Albuquerque, whether it was the county and or the city or, or in the state government. But the idea that there is uh, no responsibility at the state level, to me, it concerns me greatly. And I'll tell you why. It concerns me that, that as opposed to being the leader of the govern of government and the chief executive, that the, at the very very best, I would have convened a, a a conversation with with all the players in the system, CYFD, the city of Albuquerque in this case, the county of Bernalillo, and other interested parties, and said, let's have a discussion about where the system failed in this particular matter, and what is it that we need to do to make sure that we solve this going forward or else this young child's death is completely in vain, at a minimum. The second part is that we now know that the department has had some trouble filling positions, according to the governor's uh, last discussion, which is really even more concerning when we have such a high unemployment rate in New Mexico and people looking for jobs. And I know I get called all the time because of my experiences in government, et cetera, about folks looking for a job. And to think that we can't fill jobs because, according to the governor, they're stressful jobs, they're difficult jobs to fill, leaves me with a real concern about, well, what's the effort that's being done to fill the jobs? And then you couple that with the latest report from 
the legislature that talks about the fact that they reverted dollars in the neighborhood of over $6 million in the last budget gives me, again, even more cause for concern that the administration is interested in reducing government and, and reducing expenditures at the expense of the services to the folks that are the most in need. And there is no question in my mind that, that, that there uh, has to be a level of accountability on that issue as to why you keep positions vacant, why you revert dollars when there is so much need in New Mexico and there are so many other cases that are occurring. I, I will tell you on this campaign trail so far, VB, there has been at least four or five people who have talked to me about similar instances, not tragic in this case, thank God, but instances where you have uh, a family who has taken in their grandson or, or someone, but do not have custody of the child and that the parent is not um, a suitable parent or is not uh, parenting correctly, and the parent can still take the child whenever they want, and and they've talked to CYFD and others to try and solve the issue, and it's not being solved. That's that's that to me is is very very much a a very important issue that we need to follow up on, and and again that's what a conversation would would provide you with that kind of information. The other piece of it, VB, is is even uh, it concerns me even more, and that's this. As the chief executive officer, if you will, of the state, the governor has responsibility for managing agencies. It just seems to me that the people that are in her, in some of these positions and agencies, have absolutely no clue about what they're doing. It, and, and I say that because where is the cabinet secretary in this discussion? Where is where is that discussion being held that gives us all a sense that, that something really has been changed or fixed or that we're hiring positions? It's almost like the administration's perspective is is that it's not our fault. It's someone else's. It's really the, the, mar the mother's fault. And there's no question, the mother had a huge piece of it and, there's, and we know that. But there is a system in place and there, are, and there is a safety net that we've created to help these, these young children and others like them. The system failed them. Yeah. Let's fix the system and quit trying to pass judgment on all these issues we know the legal system will take its course and eventually we'll find we'll find justice but governing is about solving problems governing is about creating opportunities so these don't occur in the future and it's also going to be VB about taking responsibility sure. and and I will tell you I have been there I've been there when we've had some challenges in city government and and I've been there to say look we have a responsibility to stand up and tell the folks that it didn't work as well as it should have. What do we do to fix it? And let's focus our energy on fixing it rather than just passing it and saying, well, it was so-and-so's fault and we're done. That's not governing. And that's not what citizens expect of their governor or of their administration. And that is, is uh, what I believe is happening here. And there's going to be more discussion, I suspect, in the next 30 days uh, on this issue. And, and we'll know more in the future. But that really leaves me with a very, very, uh, very, uh, very concerned about what really is going to be done to fix the system so that we don't have another Omari situation in this state. And that's tragic, and, and we ought to learn by that. So now we see that in Roswell, um, a young child comes into school with a shotgun <laughs> and blasts two of his um, compatriots uh, in the classroom. Um, we know probably that uh, in this next legislative session there will be numbers of bills proposed uh, to try and, and deal with at least uh, uh, um, assault weapons and perhaps automatic weapons. And I really don't know what kinds of legislation will be proposed yet. But what, uh, what, what do you think is to be done about uh, the, this, this incredibly... I mean, it's a hair trigger situation. It always, it always is when all of these weapons are around. What do we do? I mean, that, those poor little kids. I believe one of them got blasted in the face with a. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I mean, their lives are changed forever. Uh, the lives of the shooter is too. What do we do? Well, the situation in Roswell is is just tragic. It's, um, it speaks to me about a whole level of other issues that are occurring in all of our communities and in our families that 
that really go beyond just the issue of, of, of the use of, of weapons, etc. I've got to tell you, VB, I'm a big believer in, in responsibility. In, in, in this case, this is a 12-year-old boy, as best we know. Yeah. And there'll be more discussion, I suspect, on the motives and other things. And it's too early to tell. But there's got to be a sense of responsibility as who owns these weapons? Who's, who was responsible for making sure that these weapons were, were locked up and, a, and not available to a, a young adolescent like this? Uh, there, is, there is no question that we see this happening across the country. It's unfortunate how many incidences we hear of school or just gun violence. Yeah. And we need as a, as a society to begin to, to have a conversation about how do we really manage this, this, this situation? Uh, I call it you know, gun responsibility because in many instances, it's we, the adults, that are partly responsible as, as parents and or as guardians uh, when you see young children like this bringing weapons into school. Uh, it's, it's, it's tragic, and, and there's no question about the fact that, uh, that assault weapons and those types of weapons, really, you'll talk to sportsmen and others, there's no place for them in, in, in a real sense of sportsmanship. And it disconcerns me greatly, and we'll have more discussion about, about uh, what happens in the legislature, but responsibility on, the, on behalf of gun owners has got to be part of that solution. And I will tell you, the other, the other tragedy of this is really, as you said, is the shooter and, and what happens to that side of the family. And, and 12 years old, you know, maybe I've got an 8-year-old daughter and I've got a 14-year-old daughter. Uh, you know, it just, I, I can't even begin to think about why someone goes to that extreme and what causes folks to react in that fashion. But it is clear to me that um, weapons that, that are that available to children um, is, is just irresponsible gun ownership. And, and we, need to, we really need to begin to have that conversation. So I don't think this is a stretch to move from, uh, from issues of gun ownership to, to issues of honest, honest dealings when it comes to gambling contracts. <laughs> I think there's somehow a strain of uh, chiseling that's running through our society currently. Mm -hmm. um, here you have a, a sort of a famous headline now that, uh, uh, about... Um, about one of the dealers in the in the uh, in the Albuquerque Down uh, uh, Racino deal was um, I can't remember the exact verb, but was what was messing us over in in the governor's office. Mm -hmm. We see a kind of a a kind of a cheesy chiseling sort of lowbrow, uh, almost I can't say criminal, but uh, because we don't know, but there's a strain of, of unseemliness. Um, that doesn't help anybody. That doesn't help any situation, in my judgment. What do we? What can? Um, these are awfully hard questions to answer. But what is to be done about about these kinds of tricky dealings in this Racino thing? I mean, I I don't think anybody really really has a total handle on it yet. But I'd sure love to know what you know about it. And because it, because obviously you've been so deeply associated with the city for such a long time. I'm not not that you have anything to do with this, but but you know how these things operate. Right, right. Well, it goes back to this discussion we've had uh, now for a couple of minutes here, and that is the 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 public's perception of, of government has got to be uh, a positive one, and one that that for the folks in the communities feel as if their government is is acting in good faith, following its own processes, and making sure that whether it's a Racino deal or or whatever contract. That there is a there is a prescribed process in the procurement rules <clears throat> that uh, really dictates how these contracts are awarded and managed, and and you move forward. And what you see again is this behind the scenes discussion, where you have citizens appointed to, in this case, to the the state fair board, to make decisions on this, who really aren't versed in the procurement process, and to some extent, not, probably don't need to be. But I need to know and appreciate that there is a certain level of, of responsibility on their part for making these decisions. But more importantly, that undue influences from outside, if you will, sources, such as in this case, again, political operatives, 
first of all, is inappropriate. You ought not have political consultants calling up board members appointed by the governor and, and basically giving them grief for not making the decision you want them to make. That's, you're not part of the government. You're not a government official. Uh, more importantly, government officials ought not be doing that either. I mean, if this is such a great deal and this board member had some concerns, which apparently he did, um, a delay uh, to learn more about what was going on or ask additional questions is totally appropriate. They're citizens. That's why these boards are set up as so such, to give a governor and give the legislature and give the citizens of the state a sense that we have independent eyes looking at these things. We have people who have the best interest of the state looking at this because they're citizens. They're not vested in, in the government. But then you have the, the whole discussion of, of, again, a political operative coming in and basically telling another operative who apparently was related to this particular individual in the commission that he didn't do what he was supposed to do. And I think the word was screwed us, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes I believe that's the word. And, and I'm thinking to myself, well, first of all, as a former administrator in, in, uh, of government programs and government processes, well, it was none of his business. He's not a government official. He's not a, anyone involved in the process. He's a political operative. But he is a political operative for the governor, and more importantly, he's a fundraiser. And so is this young lady. And so then it leads you to the conclusion, well, were these big-time contributors to the governor's campaign and or PAC, and now are we giving them a payback for, for having given dollars? And, and that is where it lies the concern for, for myself as a citizen uh, and for someone who has been involved in, in government that, that we do have a, at least an appearance that there's some, something else happening behind the scenes here that may come up later as more investigations are done into the situation. They may hopefully shed more light on this issue. But I've got to tell you, Vivi, uh, I've awarded many, many contracts in the course of my time in City Hall, and big contracts for airport runways, for, for the rail runner, for many other projects. I will tell you, this one to me is by far, if it doesn't break the law, it is very close to at least violating the spirit of the program and the spirit of the law, which is you should not have undue influence on citizens and folks who are making decisions on behalf of the state on contracts of this magnitude. And, um, and I know that that leaves a bad taste in the citizens' perspective of government. It sheds some real doubt in terms of, again, how things are being done and managed. And that really is the long-term implications I think, for all of us as citizens that we begin to lose faith in our government. And, and again, I go back to this governor ran on a record of transparency on reforming government and that this were not the kinds of deals we we're going to have in this administration. And right out, the, right out of the can, if you will, so to speak, right off the bat, the very, very, the very first major contracts are all tainted with this kind of influence. And, and, it, and it really is uh, a sad situation because we're better than that. We ought to be better than that. And, and our citizens deserve better government. And they deserve government that's, that does not engage in these kinds of, of if you will, uh, if you will, relationships and, 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 and influences. And um, I know there'll probably be more on this discussion and we'll see what happens in the future as more folks are, re are reviewing this, this contract. But um, yeah, in my turn, tenure in government and understanding how these work, uh, this certainly is a, uh, leaves me with a lot of concerns about how government and other contracts might be influenced that we have not even began to talk about. So we know that there's a, uh, I guess the old word used to be cronyism. Uh, <laughs> we know that our, our publisher, uh, Mercury, uh, Benir Aragon, has, has done a wonderful tracking of all of the private interests and who's getting, <clears throat> who's getting the money and where the money is going in, ter in terms of education reform. Mm -hmm. It's really not about education reform, it's about corporate enrichment uh, at the expense of students and, uh, and the state of New Mexico. Uh, I guess one of the things that, that puzzle me is, is uh, how, how, how have they gotten away with this? What, uh, in your judgment, how have they gotten away with this? How have they slipped past the public, if you will, the public censor who says, wait a minute, 
don't be doing this. This is this is baloney. Mm-hmm. How have they gotten that? Bibi, I think the answer to your question may be all of the above. Mm-hmm. It may be that we all have uh, not paid enough attention, not focused on on what actually is occurring. I, I have got to tell you this um, this whole structure of quote under the guise of reform of education concerns me tremendously because you're absolutely right this is a model that is really geared towards privatization of education of public education and and the idea that uh, it's wrapped under the guise of reform to some extent i believe have lulled all of us to think that we're actually going to come up with some really good and innovative ideas on how to make our educational system better I mean, we all can have a conversation about that for, for hours, about what we believe needs to happen in education to make it better, and to, but at the expense of our children, and quite frankly, at the expense of the people who are out there day to day, our educators, our teachers, who are making, you know, having, creating miracles in our classrooms every day, and who are committed to their profession, and go beyond the call, if you will, to buy equipment, to buy supplies, to help children influence their lives, etc. And we continue to hammer on this issue that the testing and evaluation, etc. is, and, and by the way, and labeling schools, by the way, is going to make the system better. I will tell you, Vibi, I again, going back to my experience in managing large, large organizations, you want to change an organization? You've got to make sure that the organization is part of the solution, because you can you can make you can uh, pontificate new structures and new ideas, etc. But if the people in the system aren't part of the solution, you're beating your head against the wall because the system they need to be part of the solution. And in this case, they've been left out, and not only have they been left out, they've been made the villains in this whole process. And again, it goes back to this whole idea that we have got to be really more attuned to what really is, I believe, occurring with public education. That is that you have this model coming out of Florida and other parts of the East Coast under a very conservative umbrella of privatization. For example, the tests that we're using, we're testing our kids to death. And they're all tests being bought from out-of-state companies who are selling tests to New Mexicans. And and then we have this whole discussion about this evaluation process that, again, uh, begins to villainize the teachers as they're the bad, they're the problem with the system. Well, I've got to tell you, they, they're part of the solution. They and they got to be part of the solution. And it goes back to my whole perspective of governance, and that is that governance is about, yes, identifying the challenge. And sure, you've got to have accountability. But what people really want at the end of the day is they want the solution. How are you going to make this better? And how do we make sure that that solution really helps us move if you will, the issue down the road, and we get better schools. And this administration, in my opinion, is so focused on finding and pointing out who the problem is that the solution never comes. And as a result, Mm. they're blaming the wrong people Mm. or they're creating an additional level of consternation and anxiety amongst the very people that we're entrusting our children to, our educators. I firmly believe that if we're going to do some reform in education in New Mexico, it's got to be about bringing everyone to the table. I, I think you'll remember when this governor began her whole endeavor on education, she appointed this commission or this board of out-of-state educators, people from out-of-state, not one from New Mexico, not, not any school teacher, anyone that was in New Mexico's education system to really begin to identify, well, this is the way we do it. Now let's find out how others are doing it and let's all work together to make it happen. So it's been a top-down model from the beginning. Um, and as a result, it's created a whole level of consternation. And again, my biggest fear is is a lot of what you describe. Is it is this really about reform? Is this really about making education better, or is it really about an agenda that is about privatization? It's about creating opportunities for potential donors or contributors or others who may be related to the administration that we won't see the payoff until the next four years. And, and I've got to tell you, uh, I, I do take a, 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 a strong, uh, have a strong concern over this current Secretary of Education's perspective that, that trust me, you'll, it'll work when everything we've been doing seems to be pointing to, to more concern, more, more consternation. And, um, and I'm for one, uh, you know, you've got to lead by example. And so far, 
uh, I don't see any leadership on this issue except creating what I call this facade of um, let's make noise about the issue and give everyone a sense that we're doing something because education has got to be fixed and uh, and there's really no solution. And I'll got to tell you, labeling schools are not going to make schools better, in my opinion. What you're going to end up having is the poor schools who get the bad grades are going to have even more concerns because imagine a child going to an F school. I mean, what kind of sense of of pride, what kind of sense of, of self-worth is they going to have when everyone says, well, I go to an F school? Is that really changing that education system as opposed to saying to them, let's figure out how we put resources in a direct way and let's see how we may begin to create opportunities to provide better education. And let's bring in the educators. Let's bring in the professionals who do it every day. And let's look at outside practices. I'm not opposed to having innovation and outside best practices come to the table. That's what makes us better. But we've got to have a solution that is co is comprehensive and that is inclusive. And we don't have that now. And, and that's really, unfortunately, the road that this administration has taken. And, and it's created such a negative situation and such a pushback that I don't think that even if it was the right road, which I don't believe it is, that they'd get the results they want because everyone is, is very, very concerned about what's going on. So just to try and wrap this up, I mean, I know we could talk forever and ever and ever sure about, it, about all these issues, but probably the most pressing issue in our, in our state and at the moment, other than uh, incredible gross mismanagement and other things that we've been talking about, is water, obviously. And uh, the, uh, the, the slow and the steady but the sure appearance of climate change and its impact on our drought and, and, and flooding uh, cycles and on our aquifer. Uh, we know we have a state water plan that's that's uh, sort of been giving uh, probably a token amount of money, uh, but we also have a, a serious issue about uh, contaminated water, and one of the most serious ones is here in Albuquerque, mm -hmm. as you know. Um, are you satisfied that what's happening with the Kirtland Air Force uh, base spill of 24 million gallons of jet fuel, possibly the largest in American history? is being handled in an expeditious and, uh, and uh, efficient way. Well, I will tell you, water is such a precious resource for the state, quite frankly, for the world, if you think of it in the world's Absolutely. global scale. And the fact that we have, as you said, a, a state water plan that really hasn't evolved into the next level, which is really having some strong policy and discussion really concerns me given that, uh, again, where we are with water and, and what's happened with, our, with our, our, our water issues in New Mexico over the last decade, which really, again, speaks to leadership and having a, a stronger voice and a stronger direction out of Santa Fe about water in general. I happen to know a little bit about this Kirtland issue because when I was a city manager of Albuquerque, we dealt with it. And that's early in the years when the identification of the spill has already been identified and that the Air Force was going to move towards remediation, et cetera. It has become even more critical now because, as we all know, the, the aquifer in Albuquerque and the, that we all thought once was vast and, and endless is not. And this contamination issue is really critical that we begin to have a much more directed, if you will, approach to, to resolving it. And I will tell you, I am as frustrated as anyone else in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, because we ought to have had, we, we should be much further ahead now, keep in mind, I was the manager in the decade of the 90s. We had conversations with the Air Force about this very issue and how to move forward with the resources that cleans up this, this contaminated water and that moves forward with a real solution. And it's been, I believe, a, a lack of real oversight on part of the Air Force and a lack of, exert, of, of, if you will, of, of urgency on behalf of the Air Force and potentially even on behalf of all of us, that we're not putting more pressure on the Air Force and on our congressional delegation and our leadership in Washington, that something needs to be done in a much more aggressive manner. Uh, this, this contamination has a major, major impact into Albuquerque's water future. And quite frankly, again, speaks again to the fact that we have got to be diligent on this issue. I will just say one thing to you. Years ago, when I was at the city, we entered into an agreement with the, with the Department of Defense and provided them a, an agreement that said, basically, we want to be part of the monitoring of the problem because we, we couldn't even get on the base to go do monitoring. Right, right. 
we had to go through a a huge debate with the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy and others just to get access to have the data so that we knew what the extent of the issue was. Because, as you know, behind the fence stays behind the fence. Yes. And we made some progress on that. We even went to the extent, VB, of talking to the base about potentially moving in, because they have their own water system, yeah. of migrating that water system into the city system so that we could begin to, if you will, create one major water system that manages issues, absent the, cont the contamination. Right. It never materialized because it was always pushed back by the Department of Defense in particular that that somehow or other we were going to have citizens, i.e. our water maintenance people and our water folks in the base and who knows what they could get themselves into in terms of what the base does. Which really just, again, it goes back to the whole concern that that military facilities are no question about. They're national security facilities and there's a whole level of things that happen out there you and I will never know about. But when issues like this become known to the public and become known to officials, it's our responsibility to make sure we hold them accountable. Yes. And I don't believe that we are pushing hard enough on on the Air Force. And I would urge our delegation and urge, in this case, our current governor and others, that more pressure needs to be exerted on this issue. Because this is, as you said, a major uh, issue for, for, for this uh, community. And and I, I, I venture to say there's levels of contamination by, by other governmental agencies, potentially in other parts of the state. And we really need to make sure that, uh, I'm a big believer, VB, that, that government ought to be run by example. We ought to be the example, and we ought to be held to a higher standard. Yeah. Because we, we are, we are the, the leaders. We, people need to look to us. Mm -hmm. And um, when we began, for example, the San Juan Chama Water Project and the conservation effort here in Albuquerque back in the decade of the 90s, and we talked about taking all the turf out of public facilities and going to xeriscapes so that we could conserve water because we knew that water was a precious resource. The first thing we told the city council and we told the citizens of Albuquerque, we need to lead by example. We took off turf out of medians. We took off turf around the edges of, of parks to, you know, and in light of a lot of consternation from folks who really like their green space. <laughs> but the idea was that we don't want to water their streets. We don't want to water sidewalks. We want to create opportunities for us to conserve. After, we, after the government did that, leading by example, did we then go in and say, okay, now citizens, how about doing low flush toilets, low flow um, you know, equipment in your, in your homes, you know, converting some of your, your water heaters, et cetera, and giving you rebates so that we could conserve water? Because then it became part of the next, if you will, the, the education and the fact that the community knows that, that we live in a desert yeah. and that we need to conserve water. That's not... That's how you lead by example. That's not what this Air Force has done, I believe, on this issue. And we got to really step up and make sure that they know that we're paying attention and that this issue has to be resolved. Well, this has been a great conversation. I'm really glad to have you here with us. Uh, we, uh, we wish you well, and thanks for coming today. Well, BB, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. It's always nice to talk to you. Uh, we've known each other for some time. I'm running for governor, as you know, and uh, I'm going to work really hard on behalf of you Mexicans. I have the experience and, and the know-how to get it done, and uh, and we're going to move New Mexico in a different direction. And we're going to start by making sure that folks know that uh, this is a, a governor, Lawrence Rael, that will focus on New Mexico. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here.